Hello and welcome to the first edition of GFN News on GFN.tv. GFN.tv is brought to you by the Global Forum on Nicotine. From our conference in Warsaw each June to year-round coverage of the issues that matter in tobacco harm reduction, GFN has got it covered. I'm your host, Joanna Junak. Today on GFN News. The government of the Philippines has approved a key vaporized nicotine product bill. What is FDA doing regarding the regulation of thousands of vaping products in the United States? David Swinner of the University of Ottawa shares his thoughts on doctors and nicotine. Is it true that vaping is a less effective method of quitting smoking than other nicotine replacement ads? And we bring you to the first of our interview series from Reg Watch Brent Stafford and his guest, GFN22 keynote speaker Dr. Mark Tyndall, on vaping, health and harm reduction. The Philippines is expected to make its vaporized nicotine products regulation bill law, regulating the manufacture, sale and use of e-cigarettes and heated tobacco products. Experts say that it will promote cessation and save lives among the country's 70 million smokers. Yet, the Department of Health has condemned what is called the bill blatant disregard to public health. If confirmed, the policy will be a welcome step towards harm reduction for a country that has for years conducted a brutal drug war under President Rodrigo Duterte. Meanwhile, in the United States, much uncertainty remains over the FDA role in regulating vaping products. Let's cross over to Will Godfrey from Filter Magazine for an update. Hi, Will. Hi, Joanna. Great to be here. Yes, over here, all eyes remain on the FDA as they have been for many months. As you'll recall, the agency had until September 2021 to determine, under its fledgling pre-market tobacco product application process, whether every vape product submitted was, quote, appropriate for the protection of public health and could therefore be legally sold. Missing that deadline, the agency has since approved exactly one tobacco flavored vape that very few people use, together with a couple of cartridges. It remains silent on applications from companies with the largest market share. And what about with smaller companies? Well, the FDA has meanwhile issued denials for thousands of applications from small to mid-sized companies, seemingly using a sweeping one-size-fits-all approach rather than the promised case-by-case -case evaluations. As we await decisions on the biggest players, some of those denied companies have been fighting back in court. My filter colleague, Alex Norsha, has been regularly covering these situations, so let's now switch to him for some updates. One of the main cases to follow here in the United States, if not the main case, is Triton, which followed a lawsuit against the Food and Drug Administration in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. As is the case with most of these denied vape manufacturers, the company's argument partly rests on an internal memo that circulated around the FDA's Center for Tobacco Products. This happened not long after politicians grilled Acting Commissioner Janet Woodcock about her, leg her agency's plan to regulate e-cigarettes and keep them out of the hands of minors. The memo revealed that the FDA, likely in a rush to get through an onslaught of PMTAs, adopted a checklist-like method to get through as many applications as possible. The FDA essentially looked for vape manufacturers that make flavored vaping products, many of which spent millions of dollars already, and rejected their PMTAs that they had not completed scientific trials that many noted were, not re were required only after the application deadline. Triton, as dozens of others who filed similar lawsuits in different appeals courts throughout the U.S., is arguing that the FDA acted arbitrarily and capriciously through this process. Some companies have been granted judicial stays, which allow them to continue selling their denied products as their cases work their way through the legal system. Oral arguments have begun in a few cases, and while some judges seem sympathetic to the plaintiffs, it's unclear what will happen next. Will Triton's application, for example, be remanded back to the FDA and the company be given time to complete these long-term studies? Will the FDA's flawed bureaucracy prevail? The decision ultimately reached the Supreme Court. Thank you, Alex. Will, let's go over to the next topic. The lack of awareness that physicians have around tobacco harm reduction issues is a matter of deep concern to many in our field. Professor David Swinner recently shared some thoughts about this problem in Canada. Let's listen to him. Doctors are misinformed on our leading cause of preventable death. Uh, a leading cause of preventable death where the solutions are actually not that complicated, but they're being held back because of that misinformation. How do we educate doctors? Simply making them aware 
that they're misinformed could be a very important first step. Does this only happen in Canada, Will? Uh, no way. Uh, besides being a chronic issue, this is also almost ubiquitous. For example, I recall a 2020 study on which we reported at Filter showing that around 80% of US physicians held basic misconceptions about nicotine's purported harms, including the belief that it directly causes cancer or heart disease. And colleagues in countries from Nigeria to India have told me of similar misconceptions. As David expressed, it's as shocking as it is familiar, and it's a reflection, I think, of how deprioritized nicotine and tobacco are in healthcare, as well as of swirling misinformation in general. I suppose responses to this problem fall into two main baskets, reaching out to physicians and health authorities to educate them on these topics, or bypassing them altogether by providing alternative information and resources, such as drop-in centers. Colleagues in the UK, for example, and several other countries have told me about current projects to achieve both of these goals. Thank you, Will, for your contribution to this episode. See you next time. Thanks, Joanna. See you again soon. A recent study from the University of California suggests that vapes are less helpful in quitting smoking than traditional smoking cessation aids. Their research analyzed between 2017-2019 found that nearly 60% of recent former smokers who were vaping daily had resumed smoking by 2019. We spoke to Senior Director of Quality and Science at the American Society of Addiction Medicine, Annie Claycamp. She thinks the findings may need a second look. Yeah, so my reaction to the study is the, there, there are several limitations of the findings. Um, a lot of people have talked about this, experts that understand um, population level data. I'm more of a laboratory-based researcher, but I would say three primary things that um, make me question the findings and wanna make sure that they're shared um, with this information with the public. One, the study is a population level study. So you've got data collected through a survey, it's a path study. It's very different than a controlled trial. That's important because we have controlled trials showing the e-cigarettes can promote cessation, including a Cochrane review, which is collapsing data across trials. And so the fact that that Cochrane review, those trials represented in it, show the e-cigarettes promote cessation or are associated with it statistically, um, and that this study does not show that, that should be something we keep in mind. Why is that? And that sort of goes to the methodology. So there could be many reasons that someone might use an e-cigarette and then um, you find that they may not be able to stop with it. Maybe they are not using that e-cigarette in a way that delivers the nicotine that they need to replace smoking. And we know that a lot of the device types used in this particular sample were older, they weren't the newer generation that might be delivering nicotine more on par with smoking. So for example, Jules, and that's important. That's delivering nicotine in a way that better models smoking is the way nicotine replacement was developed. And you need to be able to deliver that nicotine so a person doesn't go into withdrawal and wants to smoke. Um, other reasons could be variables or variants that it's just difficult to control for in a population level study. So that's a, just an inherent challenge to any study where you're surveying people. There may be particular um, considerations that even statistically you'll never be able to control for. Um, I would say the other thing I wanted to point out about this study, my, my reaction to it is it's very focused on cessation. So the, the main outcome is, was there any puff from a cigarette in the last 12 months? Any puff. To me, that is an important data point. But for me, I'm also interested, were you able to reduce your smoking at all? Were you able to reduce any of the harms, carbon monoxide levels from smoking? Maybe because you didn't do a full switch and maybe you occasionally puffed on a cigarette at a party, but compared to the year before, maybe you reduced your smoking by 50%. I think that to me is more important because my understanding of any type of drug that you are trying to replace with another behavior, reducing that dangerous behavior, smoking, 
in any way is going to improve your health. And so I think that that messaging is important. Um, I'm worried the way this study has been shared in the popular press, CNN, it's really been shared as a definitive conclusion to e-cigarettes, you know, are not able to support cessation and they're no better than placebo. But the same study found that evidence-based quote unquote treatments that have been approved by the FDA and other regulatory agencies like nicotine replacement therapy, varenicline, were also not very effective. And this really makes you question what was going on in this study. So if these participants were trying to stop smoking, they used nicotine replacement, something that we recommend all over the world, and they still weren't able to smoke most of them. I think it was above 80%. Um, we're not talking about that in the coverage in CNN. And I think this is a really big problem because if you're a smoker and you're reading that study, you may be less inclined to try e-cigarettes. And we know as shown by the Cochrane Review, among other data, that there are a lot of people that have stopped or reduced their smoking because of e-cigarettes. And that's a really important message that's lost in the coverage of this article. Thank you, Annie, for sharing your insights. And now, we are pleased to introduce the first of a regular interview series of GFN.TV in partnership with RecWatch. Today, Brent Stafford interviews leading Canadian harm reductionist Dr. Mark Tyndall, who is set to deliver a keynote speech at GFN 22 in Warsaw. Over to you, Brent. Hi, I'm Brent Stafford and welcome to RegWatch on GFN.TV. This is the first segment of what will be an ongoing contribution to the important discussion around tobacco harm reduction at global scale. Joining us today is one of our favorite guests, Dr. Mark Tyndall, a public health and infectious disease physician who was formerly the director of the BC Centre for Disease Control in the province of British Columbia, Canada and he's been working in the field of harm reduction and drug policy for over 25 years. Dr. Tyndall, thanks for coming back on the show. Thanks for asking me, Brent. So our conversations here on GFN.TV are intended to reach a global audience, and therefore some of our viewers today may not be familiar with you from your past appearances here on RegWatch. Please share a bit about who you are, your work, and why tobacco harm reduction is a special interest. Uh, sure. I mean, I kind of fell into this uh, through my other work in, in harm reduction. And uh, at, that, at the time I first got interested, I was working in Ottawa, which was about eight years ago. And uh, my job there was to try and prevent people from getting HIV and hepatitis C who are using injection drugs. And uh, it became clear to me that uh, with the treatments that we had for these uh, these infections that I had spent my career working on, uh, they they weren't killing people. It was uh, smoking that was killing people. So uh, my the the prospective cohorts I was working in, uh, the the leading cause of death by far was uh, cigarette smoking. And uh, so I got um, with my the lessons I'd learned from harm reduction, um, I I started getting interested in alternative ways to get nicotine, and uh, and vaping was uh, emerging at that time, and uh, and I've just uh, been uh, been following this and trying to promote this idea now for uh, eight years probably. So you're a doctor, doctor, as we kind of say here on Rag. Watch you have patients you treat. Uh, yeah, well, that's been my career. I uh, mostly infectious diseases, but I'm also a researcher. Uh, I, have a, I have a doctoral degree in epidemiology, and uh, so I've done uh, my fair share of, uh, of research over the years. So let me ask you, when it comes to safer nicotine products, specifically nicotine vapes, what's your position? Well, everybody should be using them. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very... Uh, very frustrated when I see the the lack of movement on this. I think uh, you know, like many of us, we I believe this is uh, the biggest contribution we could make to public health and improving uh, the global uh, uh, a global health statistics if we could get people off cigarettes. And so uh, I'm an ardent sort of anti-tobacco person, but I'm also very realistic that uh, this is not going to be solved by like banning cigarettes. I mean, this is, uh, people uh, use these substances like they use other substances. We have to get, uh, accept that, that uh, abstinence is not an effective way to uh, 
get people off cigarettes for the most part. And so uh, people deserve alternatives and uh, we could make a, a huge impact if we got people the right information out there and, uh, and transition people off cigarettes. So the big question, uh, amazing that I still have to ask it, but are nicotine vapes safe? Uh, well, it's all, you know, the, the biggest lesson you learn in uh, epidemiology is relative risk. So, I mean, this is a, we're stuck with this uh, ridiculous argument that, uh, well, they're not safe. Um, so therefore we shouldn't be promoting them. Well, that's just, uh, it makes absolutely no sense, uh, relative to cigarettes. They're, uh, they're very safe. So, uh, you know, and, uh, the, the same kind of, uh, ridiculous argument goes uh, that we really don't know how safe they are because we haven't seen them. We don't have the research. Where's the, you know, where's the evidence and, uh, man, again, uh, we do have quite a bit of evidence, um, that because uh, tobacco has been so vilified, uh, there's no uh, external uh, evaluation of any of this stuff. They, all we can measure is how uh, toxic cigarettes are, but uh, there's really, uh, there's no money involved in uh, actually doing the proper long-term long -term research. Um, but it's, it's just so clear. And again, you know, just try to be practical, you know, we, we know right down to the molecule what's killing people with, uh, with cigarettes and all the toxins in, in a cigarette or combustible tobacco. And uh, to tell me that you take all those chemicals out and it doesn't make any difference, um, it must be just as dangerous. It, it, it's, just, it's just ludicrous. I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. So uh, the, the two uh, uh, really sticking points are that uh, the public has not been told the truth about how uh, how relatively safe these products are, and uh, we haven't uh, yeah we haven't incentivized people to to try it, and we're stuck you know this far down the road. Uh, the attitudes toward vaping among people who smoke cigarettes is uh, is just wrong. Like most people, <laughs> just don't. Uh, don't want to hear that they're safer and we've been uh that's uh, been a huge uh you know a, a huge misstep in uh in the way we've tried to promote these things now obviously are people becoming ill or dying because of this misinformation yeah well there's just so much misopportunity i mean the because cigarettes and and illnesses to do tobacco have been around for so long, we've just got so used to it. And any incremental improvement is, uh, you know, with when we see in Canada that the smoking rates are, you know, going down a percentage a year or something, somehow that status quo is uh, accepted as uh, being okay. And it's, it's just not, I mean, we've just got so used to the uh, massive uh, health impact of uh, cigarettes that we're, we're just so complacent. And uh, how we can still uh, fully support abstinence-based programs that uh, the only thing we know about them is how ineffective they are. And uh, we need to offer people alternatives and, uh, and to give them the give them the truth. So I think there's been, you know, just a lot of really bad uh, coverage about this and uh, and people have not been given the truth again we've been so preoccupied with youth vaping and this whole conspiracy theory that uh, big tobacco is going to try and poison our youth with uh, addictive nicotine products and they're all going to go on to smoking and we're going to start all over again I mean that, that just doesn't make any sense at all like it, it just it, it just doesn't so far-fetched um, that um, I, I can't believe this has kind of been uh, allowed to be the narrative. Why is it that so many within public health believe vaping products are dangerous? Well, I think, um, I don't know if they do. Um, they, uh, uh, they, most people avoid the, the issue. You know, if you say, you know, we, we, the vaping eliminates all these uh, toxins. I mean, it, it's, it's, pretty much impossible to make a mechanistic argument that uh, that vaping causes cardiovascular disease. Like uh, how? Like it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't. So uh, the, um, 
yeah, yeah. So, I, but people don't really fixate on that. And uh, I think you've mentioned this many in many of your shows. I mean, they've kept changing the goalposts that that people uh, can't really defend the fact that they are uh, as dangerous, but they uh, now focus on nicotine, and nicotine must be the dangerous thing, and we need to protect our youth and uh, for, from addicting to nicotine. So they've kind of that's changing the kind of the goalposts of things. You mentioned nicotine, Dr. Tyndall. One of the things obviously that's going on is the gateway. That that particular issue never seems to go away. It is whack-a-mole, there's no doubt. One minute it's, you know, teen epidemic, the next minute it's E Valley, some mysterious, you know, uh, vaping related lung illness. Huh. I mean, when does it end? Yeah. No, I mean, the gateway thing, I think, has been disproven so many times. I mean, we've, you know, in Canada, at least, we vilified cigarettes so much that it's, it's just not an attractive thing for youth to, to want to do. And so uh, that to think that people would start using a nicotine vape and then all of a sudden think that cigarettes would be a good idea is, uh, does, is preposterous. It just will not, it would not happen. And uh, unless... Uh, we try to prohibit access to any vaping products. So that's, that's the, the downside, but uh, prohibition never works. Um, and that's uh, the, you know, the whole Valley story, which uh, set vaping back quite a bit um, is basically a story of prohibition. And so we've allowed, we, 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 you know, people uh, started making this stuff up and uh, there was, uh, you know, huge consequences to that. So we need a, a regulated, truthful way to uh, get people access to this. Obviously, uh, they should not be advertised as a lifestyle thing and that uh, I'm, you know, or we're not there to promote vaping to, to young people. Um, but we can uh, really should be promoting it heavily to people who uh, smoke cigarettes. And the, and the other, you know, the other irony of all this with our prohibition is that, uh, sure, youth will try nicotine. I mean, they, it, they'll try a lot of substances. And that's, that's kind of why cigarettes have continued. The biggest thing, if we're really interested in youth smoking um, and youth vaping, then we try to work very hard on uh, adult smokers to switch. And they, because the biggest reason that uh, a youth will take up smoking is because they uh, have uh, their parents or aunts and uncles or other acquaintances who smoke. Like that's a, that's the biggest. And so if you really want to help uh, the next generation, you would want to encourage uh, parents who smoke to switch from cigarettes, get off cigarettes. That would be the best way to discourage uh, the next generation of cigarette smokers, for sure. I think that uh, people should have a, uh, you know, have awareness that if they start vaping or start using nicotine because they enjoy the nicotine, um, there's a, a price to pay. And that means you're probably going to continue to use that nicotine. I mean, I, I think that it uh, doesn't pose a, a, a long-term danger if you're using nicotine every day, but um, that's something people have to, you know, should be approaching with the eyes wide open. I mean, um, but, you know, I, most smokers I know actually enjoy smoking and they enjoy the nicotine. So um, I don't know. I, I think that, uh, um, you know, the, the, the irony is when the uh, people that I deal with mostly day to day are people using harder drugs. I don't know where they'd be without nicotine. I mean, it, when they, it's way better to get up in the morning and, uh, and smoke a cigarette or use a vape than probably to run out and shoot heroin, I think. And the, this is all, you know, it's, 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 it's a type of harm reduction for a lot of people. And if they weren't smoking, I don't know what else they'd be doing, but they, you know, um, Anyways, I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a hard and fast uh, anti-cigarette person. I mean, I, I really think that cigarettes cause a lot of damage and uh, really unnecessary damage when we have alternatives for ways for people to get nicotine. And so there's really no reason that we'd want to burn, burn leaves. I mean, we, we really need to think of this way more sophisticated, except that people will use substances like they like coffee and coke 
and alcohol and all the things in our society. This is part of it. Nicotine's one of them. And uh, we want to offer people a regulated, safe way to, uh, to get it. Have you ever been in a position where other public health colleagues that you've been working with have been very pro harm reduction for drugs like heroin? In fact, indeed, in Canada, we are actually giving that out now as a part of the harm reduction for drugs program, but yet they're adamant that nicotine harm reduction is not a valid um, use of the theory. My colleagues in public health, um, definitely I'm still on the outside looking in as far as my attitudes and my promotion of uh, tobacco harm reduction. And, uh, and these same people will be uh, very supportive of uh, supervised injection sites and harm re other harm reduction things that I've been involved in. And uh, I mean, they've come along, like the, there has been a movement. I think harm reduction 25 or 30 years ago was still in its infancy. And there was a lot of concerns about enabling people and encouraging more people to be doing these things if we gave out needles and allowed people to inject in safety and things. But I think that's evolved over time. But uh, my experience is there's still a, a hard stop with uh, cigarettes because people feel that you should just stop. Like, it, you know, we all know people who have stopped. Uh, why don't you? Like, that's kind of the kind of the thinking that we don't need alternatives for people. They should just uh, they should just stop. And that's uh, and leave it at that. And uh, I think that's still the attitude, whereas people who are using heroin and cocaine and these other notorious drugs, people feel, well, maybe they can't stop. You know, maybe we have to give them, a, you know, a little bit of a, a, a roadway into stopping. But uh, for tobacco, it's just hard and fast. Like if you smoke cigarettes, you're killing yourself. Just stop. And so it's uh I think that's the that's the huge roadblock that uh, people don't really see that, uh, you know, for the millions of people who that clearly is not true, uh, they don't really look at it that way. It's it's just uh, you know there's they people don't need an alternative. Why would we offer people a nicotine alternative? Like they just don't need nicotine. Well, actually, talk to five million Canadians. They they differ. They, they do think they need nicotine. So. so let's talk a minute then about Canada and what's specifically going on in that country. Currently, nicotine vaping is legal in Canada. And of course, Canada has been a world leader in the fight against combustible tobacco. Yet Health Canada is in the process right now of potentially banning flavors. What's your assessment of what Health Canada is doing? It, it makes no sense. I mean, uh, I, you know, the the idea that all the focus is on youth and somehow only youth want flavors, which is totally against everything we know about the vaping industry in Canada, where flavors are a critical component to people uh, trying it and continuing it. And, uh, and why not? Like, it's just so, so punitive to me that uh, it should be people's right. If they, you know, they have a flavor, like I, it shouldn't, shouldn't make any difference. So I, Canada, but I, I do fear that uh, it's been kind of quiet the last, uh, the last few months. It's unclear what the final decision, but um, everything I've heard that probably there'll be a flavor ban and, or at least leave it open to uh, provinces to make flavor bans and provinces love it. So uh so I'm really fearful that uh, that could happen in Canada. Um, and there's really, uh, you know, it's very damaging to uh, people who are trying to, to transition. And uh, that, you know, again, the irony is that, uh, you know, uh, Health Canada might say that, well, people, uh, why don't we give them tobacco? That's what they're tobacco flavored. Well, the, actually one of the ways to get off your cigarettes is to get rid of that tobacco flavor. I mean, we, we need to give people a, an alternative to that. So, um, you know, I think it's really, uh, really be a serious uh, misstep if that happens in Canada, um, you know, but I think the people that are getting the most attention still are uh, uh, anti-youth vaping advocates who uh, still hold to this contention that, uh, all, the only reason that youth are using these uh, the, the vaping is uh, because they like the flavors, and uh, it's just not not true. And uh, but unfortunately, that's the narrative that's persisted.
I know you'll be speaking at the Global Forum on Nicotine Conference in Warsaw, Poland this June 16 to 18. Why is a conference like GFN 22 important and what might your message be? To be honest, Brent, my, my, my academic and medical career has not really been in the tobacco area. So I'm, you know, this is come somewhat new to me. I know of uh, tobacco um, conferences that are uh, currently held in Canada and some globally that are basically abstinence space. They haven't, cha- they, they are out there actively undermining uh, safer nicotine. Like that, that, so that is the forum that most tobacco people have and if you I know for a fact um, you know I've been disinvited to public health conferences because of my stance on vaping so there's a there's a very closed door the forum I think is the only place that I know of that uh, invites the range of opinions and uh, and has a you know a wide tent for people to uh, discuss this but uh it's hard to find any kind of global or at least Canadian or North American uh, tobacco conferences where you can openly talk about alternatives. It's a very closed shop that uh, the most prominent people in this field have been at it uh, for a while. Uh, they're abstinence-based and uh, they're not even open to uh, discussing this. And instead of seeing uh, alternatives as a way to improve people's health or give people other options, uh, they look at it as a a side door for uh, more uh, more nicotine addiction and more tobacco use and uh, are totally dismissive of any uh, any benefits that, that people can gain from vaping. Last issue, Dr. Tyndall, are there any potential allies in this battle that we should be thinking about and working with? If we're serious about making a massive transition and actually eliminating cigarette smoking in some kind of time frame, we need to get on board with uh, companies who make cigarettes and are very open, I think, to coming up with alternatives. So they probably do want to uh, salvage their uh, the, their money. <laughs> they, they, they're a company that... Uh, uh, probably aren't interested in just shutting down cigarettes, but they are probably very interested in uh, coming up with safer alternatives. And so I think we need to, uh, you know, uh, help guide uh, the tobacco companies who are, you know, still manufacturing cigarettes. And, uh, um, you know, uh, if you go to the website of Philip Morris International, I mean, they make it quite a statement that they want to get out of the cigarette business by 2035. You know, I think it's much like we do with uh, with climate change and trying to get into the oil and gas industry and help them transition. And uh, they probably are open to it. But if we're if we're just nothing but hostility and we just set ourselves up as, you know, cigarettes are bad, the companies that produce them are bad, we want to wipe them out it's going to be a long, long haul. Like it's just not going to happen anytime soon. And it's just so unnecessary because uh, the companies themselves will do all the heavy lifting. It wouldn't even be a big uh, expense for, uh, for governments. Like they don't, they don't need to recreate this thing. The technology exists. The companies will transition. They need to be incentivized to trans to transition for sure. But um uh, we, th- I think that's the only way that we're going to see in the next decade uh, cigarettes go away in Canada if we, uh, if we embrace kind of uh, the new technology that can be offered through uh, com- existing companies who make cigarettes. So I think that's the, the only practical way forward. Allowing safer nicotine products to be a path of redemption for big tobacco. Yeah, well, I think they can. I mean, they, they can. I mean, they're motivated by money. But the, the problem is, unless they're incentivized, some of these big advocacy pieces like flavors and taxes and things that if as long as they have a steady stream of uh, cigarette sales, their motivation to really go after these policies are, are a bit stunted. You know, they're not, you know, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, then we are, we're selling a lot of cigarettes and we're making a lot of money, you know? So I do think that um, they really need to be pushed and uh, guided and uh, incentivized and cajoled. And so I think they can be moved in that direction, but they, it's going to be a slow process if 
all they get is uh, backlash from governments and government policies, and they're not going to go way out on the limb and uh, jeopardize their uh, uh, their cigarette sales. So they're they're going to you know they're going to try and play by the rules, and so we really need uh, st still strong advocacy to uh, get them pushed it pushing harder, basically, to make these changes. Thank you, Brent and Mac, for a great discussion. We look forward to seeing you both in Warsaw this summer. Thanks for watching and see you next time for more tobacco harm reduction updates and Brent for coming interview with Dr. John Orston. Book your place for GFN in June in Warsaw. And find out how to submit a GFN5 at our website gfn.events. That brings us to the end of the first edition of GFN News. Goodbye for now.